Good evening to everybody. Um, I was kind of putting the finishing touches to this talk this afternoon because I believe in living dangerously and finishing them all at the last minute. But basically it was because it's been striking me over the last few days that despite many years of giving history talks and having to confine what I have to say to the amount of time allocated in a programme, I tend to still tend to overstretch myself in terms of my ambitions for what I would like to discuss. Now, over the last year of confinement to online presentations, I've made some short MP4s for Fibsborough Library on aspects of the history of the area, and they were posted on the library's Facebook page. And I've done similar features on the local history of the neighbourhoods surrounding the other two libraries in the central Dublin area, Charleville Mall and the Central Library in the ILAC Centre. So I've collected a fair amount of material, uh, particularly on Fibsborough, because when I started, I wasn't that familiar with the history of the area. And I always intended to do something about Fibsborough during the revolutionary period. Uh, and of course, this is where I ran into difficulties when I was putting together this talk, because I have collected so much material and I've read so many fascinating accounts of that uh, decade in particular, that um, I realised that the title I had given to the Dublin Festival of History was way too broad and that it would be impossible to deliver a comprehensive piece in the time that I allowed, or that I was being allowed, I should say, because I could talk forever. Anyway, I think I might have called this piece Aspects of Revolutionary Fibsborough or something similar, as that would have been more accurate. So I hope I haven't raised your expectations too much. What I'm going to talk about this evening uh, will be extracts from some of the sources that I've been looking at, and I'll tell you why I like them and why I've chosen what I have. So by the end of the 18th century, the village of Phippsburg had become well established. And by the middle years of the 19th century, three major institutions were constructed there. And these contributed in no small way to the huge growth in the population of the area and became focal points for the village's evolution from rural village to urban centre. So these would have been St. Peter's Church, uh, Mountjoy Prison down here and a rather pixelated Mater Hospital or Mater Misericordia Hospital to give it its correct title. The village itself was becoming home to many of Dublin's better off skilled working class residents who were moving from the overcrowded inner city areas. There were several tenements in Phibsborough in the early years of the 20th century, but there were also many small business people, tradesmen, clerical workers and policemen who were reasonably upwardly mobile and able to afford the higher rents or even the purchase prices of homes in Phibsborough and its surroundings. Some houses in the area were very large indeed while others were uh, substantial but seemed to have appealed particularly uh, to the upwardly mobile incomers from central Dublin. And of course there was an excellent transport system um, before it was taken away, the trams and then replaced again, uh, we're good at that in Dublin. Um, and uh, there was also the canal and uh, plenty of burgeoning industry in the area, apart from the major institutions that I have mentioned. Now, in 1913, um, Dublin Corporation uh, representation for Phibsborough was divided into two wards between Innskey on one side and Arran Key on the other side of the Black Ear Bridge. 
and uh, I have a map in a minute to show you where uh, they are, but both districts elected four councillors to the corporation. And the Iron Key councillors were all home rulers, while the Inns Key ward had three home rulers and one Sinn Féinir. Uh, this was before um, 1916, and of course the 1918 elections changed so much, and particularly 1921 local election. We're not going that far at this point. So for national elections, the constituency in the second decade of the 20th century would have been, of course, to the Westminster Parliament. Most of the area was part of the College Green constituency, where the local MP from 1915 until 1918 was John Dillon Nugent, who lived at 272 North Circular Road. Couldn't find any pictures of him, unfortunately. Now, during the lockout, uh, Nugent had been a strong supporter of the employers. Loud boo here. Uh, he was National Secretary of the Ancient Order of Hibernians. Um, I've got the low slides in the wrong order, which goes to show you shouldn't rush. Um, this is their rather glorious admission certificate. Uh, and he was also a member of the um, National Volunteers, which was John Redmond's faction um, of the Irish Volunteers. And uh, he was a city councillor as well, because of course this was well before the dual mandate was outlawed and a member of the National Executive, no less, of the Volunteers. So he remained with the Redmond faction after the split over support for the First World War. He had won the seat in 1915 after a bitter by-election in 1915, which was caused by the death of Joseph Nanetti who was a home ruler, but by all accounts, a much more decent person. Um, Nugent, Dylan Nugent was opposed by Tom Farron of the Dublin Trades Council. Again, unfortunately, couldn't find a picture. And um, I'll just go back to that map, which I had in the wrong place. And um, he had made the Home Rule Party's support for the British war effort a part of his campaign and, of course, was able to make um, a fair amount of leeway on criticising uh, Nugent's rec record during the lockout. So you can see here that the majority of the constituency was on the south side of the river, which is along here. And what had been going on between uh, 1885 and then finally finished in 1922 was a fair amount of redrawing of boundaries. Initially, this had been a single constituency and then it was divided in two and uh, more or less along the lines of divided by the river. But there were four um, wards in it now, but this one was to be moved into a new constituency of Mid-Dublin. I have to confess, I can't remember exactly how far that went, but uh, it, it didn't relate to Dublin Midwest as we would have now. So here you would have had some of maybe the slightly poorer areas than um, around Phibsborough because they were still being developed. And of course there was the barracks um, and the, uh, the Royal Barracks and uh, Arbor Hill and the uh, what was left of the the central of the mental hospital at uh, Grange Gorman. So less densely populated at that time in some parts. Anyway, uh, Farron uh, said made part of his campaign the focus on um, the Home Rule Party, the Irish uh, Parliamentary Party's um, 
support for the British war effort. And by 1915 and mounting casualties, that obviously did have resonance. The constituency was a very large one, containing over 70,000 people in all, but most of them were on the south side at that point. And there were only 8,000 voters because, of course, this was before the representation of the People Act in 1918, when the franchise was extended to thankfully include women, although subject to a property qualification, but uh, many young men as well who had been barred from having a vote before that. So it would have been interesting to see what happened with Farron if he had run again in 1918. But in any case, um, Nugent supporters blackguarded Farron during the 1915 by-election and said he was a revolutionary who was opposed to Catholic education. Nevertheless, he polled over 1,800 votes in comparison to Nugent's 2,400. So that suggested there was considerable support for Labour's message in the aftermath of the lockout and the commencement of the First World War. So moving on, um, as I said, I'm going to be taking snippets from different things that interested me. And while I'd originally thought of doing a kind of who lived here sort of approach, there were too many interesting people who lived in Phippsborough and still do, of course. And there were so many different things that had happened. So I focused on some of the things that I'm particularly interested in. And I said, I'll give you the sources. So, Eamon de Valera was one of the Republican prisoners who had arrived back in Dublin um, to a tumultuous welcome on the 21st of June 1917. This was after they were released from imprisonment post the 1916 Rising. He became a national personality when he was elected as MP for East Clare on uh, the 10th of July 1917 in a by-election there. Now, at this point, de Valera was living in uh, Fibsborough at the family home of his wife, Sinead, at 34 Munster Street. Work got back to Dublin Castle and detectives from G Division, which was the detective, and were instructed to arrest him. Interestingly, one of those detectives was Eamon Broy, who had been rethinking his political allegiances after the Easter Rising. So by the time that um, de Valera was living in Phibsborough, Eamon Broy was actually had cast himself in the role of a spy for uh, the IRA. In his witness statement to the Bureau of Military History, Roy described what happened when he received the order to bring in de Valera. Now, I just want to say at this point, I love the witness statements. <laughs> I've been reading them for years and I go back and there's always something new to find. There are nearly 1800 witnesses, witness statements, and some of them are self-serving and some of them you would take with many grains of salt and others um, are very moving in their analysis of people's memories of that time. But in any case, Broyes is interesting because as you can see here on the front page of the statement, he describes himself as an IRA intelligence agent in Dublin Castle. And then he became the escort and private secretary to Collins when he was uh, involved in the War of Independence. And whether it was as a reward or as a punishment, it's hard to know. Um, Post-independence, Broy was made commissioner of the Garda Síochána, which he did for five years. And you can see him here in his uniform, still looking quite young and fit. So anyway, he said that when he got the uh, order to bring in de Valera, we were told not to inquire for him at that house for fear he might happen to be absent and our calling there might put him on his guard. Roy spent the journey to Fibsborough trying to think of some means of warning de Valera of the intended arrest. 
He remembered that an Irish volunteer named Padra Healy, uh, who had participated in the Rising, lived at 86 Fibsbury Road. But all he could do was to know where number 86 was situated in case he might find himself alone for a couple of minutes so he could go and warn Healy to warn De Valera. Roy waited until the detective accompanying him went to Mountjoy Police Station. He then sprinted down to number 86 and found Padra Healy was absent from his house, but his brother was in. I told him who and what I was and that De Valera was about to be arrested. I asked him to warn De Valera in case the latter wished to evade arrest. I sprinted back and on turning into the North Circular Road met, met Detective Sergeant Revel, who was stationed in the political office in the castle and lived in the Phippsborough area. So Roy feared that Revel, who was known for his loyalist politics, would question him about what he was doing. But luckily he, expected, he accepted the explanation he was given. Meanwhile, Broy noted that soon De Valera could be, not be observed anywhere by the detectives, who remarked that it was strange that he could be seen every day before the warrant was issued. Uh, I love that note. Um, Sinead De Valera was known as Jane Flanagan growing up. Um, but she is better remembered as Sinead and of course she I was very fond of her children's books when I was a child. I haven't seen any of them in many years, but I'm sure they're still around. Her family had moved from Phippsborough to Phippsborough from Balbriggan when her father, Lawrence, a carpenter, was working on the refurbishment of St. Peter's Church. She was working as a teacher at St. Francis Saviour School near Dorset Street and during 1899 she joined the Gaelic League and used the Irish version of her name from then on. She joined Inina Meharan and was a regular participant in their plays celebrating Irish culture. You can see her in one of her costumes here. She met Avon, Eamon de Valera when um, they were at the, an Irish college in Mayo and they married in 1910. The couple had three children and they were expecting a fourth when de Valera became commander of the 3rd Battalion of the Irish Volunteers in April 1916. So she was pregnant, he was gone, not know, she didn't know whether he was going to come back alive or what was going to happen. So she moved back to her family home in um, Fibsborough, but as her daughter remembered uh, in her statement, um, it was partly because she had literally no income. De Valera had lost his job in UCD and <laughs> was uh, either in prison or then later very preoccupied with being president of the New Republic and largely on the run. So she would have had a pretty tough few years. And Maureen um, remembers that uh, basically what her mother had to endure at that time was extraordinarily difficult. She gave birth to her son Rory while her husband was in prison. Her sister Mary had died of cancer in June 1916 and her mother Margaret became seriously ill and died in January 1917. Her father was also in bad health. So Maureen remembered how Sinead had no income and as I said had to leave their home and return to live with her parents, brothers and sisters. But as she was the only fit one, despite having so many children to mind, uh, she really was looking after semi-invalid parents, um, her elderly aunt who was sick, and her mother then had to undertake all the work of nursing her, as well as the housework, cooking and care of the babies. My elder aunt died in August 1916. My brother Rory was born in November that year and my grandmother died in January 1917. It's quite overwhelming what she had to deal with. And it's 
not all that untypical a story of women at that stage. And I have to say, I've been very pleased in recent years that the story of these women and the hardships they suffered and other aspects of the struggle for independence that women were more or less written out of for many years are finally being studied and publicised because it was a different kind of heroism, but it definitely was the sort of heroism that kept the country going. So when De Valera was released from prison in June of that year, he moved to Sinead's family home for a period. And of course, that's when he became a national figure. So you can imagine he she probably had to deal with him and people calling in and out and various other things going on. But however important her own role in her husband's political development, and he did credit her with that on occasion, uh, she remained very much in the background, looking after their children uh, during his long periods of absence. So going back to the late 19th century, as you do, um, Fenian James Boland moved into a house at Six Daily Terrace which seems to have been subsumed into uh, Phibsborough Road. Um, and I couldn't find any contemporary pictures. Uh, he was, Boland had been born in Manchester to Irish parents, and he was an active member of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, the IRB. The family returned to Ireland in 1885 and uh, he, James got a job with Dublin Corporation as an overseer. So he was better off financially than he would have been previously. Now in the 1911 Register of Voters, Daily Mount Terrace houses are described as having small gardens. So they were likely to be more modest homes than those on Phibsborough Road, which as I said, is always seems to be left of it now. But I'm very open to being informed on that subject. In any case, um, Boland met a number of other IRB members in the hut on Phibsborough Road on a regular basis. Phibsborough popularity as an area in which to rent meant that by 1913, a newer generation of activists, many from outside Dublin, found a home there. And of course, they gravitated to the meeting places that shared their particular um, political philosophy. James Boland was under con continuous surveillance by the Dublin Metropolitan Police, the DMP, as his IRB role continued. He was named number 59 of 63 dangerous Fenians by the DMP in September 1886. But he fell ill in October 1894 with a serious brain disorder. And this was thought to have been caused by serious physical attacks he'd suffered from political opponents, um, in particularly the Irish Parliamentary Party. He died on the 11th of March 1895. And following his death, two funds were raised to save his wife and young family from destitution. Enough money was raised to acquire a tobacconist business for Kate Boland. And in later life, she credited her son Harry uh, with being very helpful in that when he was young. But in 1887, in Daily Man Terrace, the Boland son, they had a son called Harry who grew up to follow in his father's footsteps, as indeed did his older brother, Gerald, and younger brother, Ned. The two older boys joined the IRB in 1904, and then all three boys joined the Irish Volunteers in 1914. Harry and Ned fought in the GPO garrison during the Easter Rising in 1916. Afterwards, Harry was sentenced to 10 years penal servitude, but he was released with the other prisoners in 1917. In the general election of 1918, Harry was elected as um, TD, or well, MP in terms of the election itself, for South Ross Common. But of course, like the other Sinn Féin candidates, he didn't take a seat. 
he missed the first sitting of the doll in the mansion house because he and Michael Collins, um, who was a close personal friend, were on their way to Sussex to help De Valera to escape from Lou's prison. He worked closely with Collins and De Valera in planning strategy during the War of Independence. Uh, and he was trusted with quite a lot of responsibility, including being sent as uh, the New Republic's delegate to the US, which is where this rather uh, suave picture was taken. But uh, when it came to the ending of the War of Independence and the treaty, Boland was unable to agree with it and he took the anti-treaty side because he was an influential character, uh, he did try acting as an intermediary between the two sides because he could see that it was likely to break out into civil war, which of course, sadly, it did. And on 31st of July 1922, after the war had started, he was shot by an officer of the Free State Army in his room in the Grand Hotel in Scarries. He died several days later, but he never named his assassin other than telling his sister that it was someone who had been a friend with whom he had shared a jail cell. And this cartoon here in the middle was part of a series that were issued uh, really with the anti-treaty side and MC being Michael Collins, um, but they were attributed to Constance Markovich and she had her own machine and is likely to have been duplicating them and distributing them fairly widely. So Boland is buried in uh, the last seven cemetery, but with his uh, brother Gerald and Gerald's wife Annie. Um, and uh, so not directly in the Republican plot. Now, Colonel Joseph Lawless, as he described here, was um, a member of the IRA who then went on to become a member of Oglick Naharan. And for a uh, particular interest became one of the investigating officers appointed to um, be involved in collection of witness statements from the Bureau of Military History. In the revolutionary years, he had been a very active member of the Irish Volunteers and later the IRA, but he described a witness statement himself in which he describes a particular incident that I have to say, in my head, every time I read this, I have music going off because it's so cinematic, the whole way he's described it. Um, anyway, it's, it's actually very serious, but I just can't help it. So he contributed this witness statement. Now, it's, it's incredibly long, but one part of it describes a frantic car chase through Fibsborough during the War of Independence, trying to find somewhere to treat the wounded Dan Breen after the notorious Fernside incident. Fernside was the name of the house where Professor um, John Carolyn had sheltered Dan uh, Breen and Sean Tracy. They had usually stayed with um, in a pub um, but the, it had been betrayed by uh, a British agent and it, what they were warned it wouldn't be safe to stay there. Unfortunately, the same informer seems to have seen them going into the house and immediately reported them. So, as I said, the house was the home of Professor John Carolyn of St. Patrick's Training College, which is now part of DCU. And the uh, a British, a, a raiding party of British intelligence officers and a party of soldiers uh, broke into the house in the early hours of the morning. They announced their intention of searching the house. They said they were looking for somebody else who obviously wasn't there. And uh, Carolyn escorted them towards the stairs. So, 
um, Dan Breen came, heard them coming up and apparently started firing from upstairs and um, they're not named here, but uh, this is, you know, Breen of course wrote his own written statement and of course my fight for Irish freedom later on, uh, but uh, Breen and Tracy broke out, were firing, two of the intelligence officers were killed and some of the soldiers were wounded. And Breen himself was shot, but he was also very badly cut when he jumped through a window to escape. So Lawless describes how he collected Breen and Tracy in his car. They had various um, ways managed to fully escape and I think Breen had actually waded across um, who would have been probably the Talca River uh, and uh, had managed to find shelter. Um, it's actually interesting that he encountered several families who had nothing to do with the IRA or with any organised group or Sinn Féin, but who took them in when it would have been a great risk to their own safety. So, as I said, he described how he collected Breen and Tracy in his car and drove through Phibsborough trying to get to the Matter Hospital, where a sympathetic medical, and pers medical personnel would treat him. So the car I was using was my old Rover, an open touring car, and as the weather was fine, it would only attract attention to put the hood up. So, um, consequently, the whole load was on open view to the public, and Vise and Kelly tried to keep Breen propped up between them in as natural a position as possible. Breen, however, had been given several sips of brandy during the morning to help in sustaining his strength and to assuage the pain he was suffering. And now the movement had increased the pain and he was somewhat delirious, possibly even drunk. He tried to trash his arms about and talk loudly so that the others had some difficulty to restrain him. But we trusted to our speed to avoid notice. Arriving at Doyle's Corner, where a traffic policeman set his hand against us, for a fraction of a second I thought of driving past him, but suddenly I saw the reason for the hold-up. A crossly tender, you can see it here, loaded with auxiliaries, was coming from the direction of the park and proceeding along the North Circular Road. My typing is pretty awful, uh, I keep seeing typos. Anyway, apologies. In the same direction in which we intended to turn. So uh, this was getting to be a bit hairy and um, they turned, with turning into Ackle Street, I had to pull over to the steps of the main entrance to the Matter Hospital, uh, but when I noticed two policemen standing ostentatiously before the door and at the same instant I caught sight of Dick McKee further down on the footpath beckoning to us, beckoning us on. As I reached him, he jumped upon the running board and informed us that the hospital was undergoing a search by police and military just then. So they emerged from Eccles Street to cross Dorset Street into Temple Street and the same tender load of auxiliaries passed down Dorset Street in front of us. For a moment I thought we'd been caught in a trap, but again they were unobservant and as they passed we crossed the thoroughfare. So you can see Dick McKee here, and sadly, of course, he was killed in Dublin Castle on Bloody Sunday, um, just a few months later. But that wasn't the end of the adventure, but you'll have to read about the rest of it in Lawless's fairly lengthy statement. It kind of reads at some parts like um, a comic uh, story, but as I said, it really was very serious. So Dick McKee actually had been born in Phibsborough Road, but he's usually, I think, more associated with Finglas because there's a memorial cross there in his honour and Cabra, where the Ogden and Bar 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 Barracks are named after him. So I mentioned earlier that the Matter Hospital was one of the three major institutions that contributed to the growth of Phibsborough, but during the revolutionary decade it was a very important source of emergency medical treatment. 
During World War I, injured soldiers were brought to Dublin on hospital ships for treatment at the hospital. While doctors and nurses from the matter travel to the front lines to assist with the care of the wounded. The hospital treated many victims of the fighting during the 1916 Easter Rising, especially the civilians who had been caught in the crossfire between the British forces and the Irish rebels. Casualties from the Crown Forces attack on Croke Park on Bloody Sunday, uh, um, 21st of November, were also brought to the Matter Hospital for treatment. Um, and uh, you can see, you know, the, the map is not entirely clear about how close to Phippsborough it stands. And um, I confess, I'm never sure whether Croke Park belongs to Phippsborough or Drumcondra, but I'm not going to fight that one out. Anyway, uh, here's Michael Hogan, Mick Hogan, who the Hogan stand is named after. Another uh, person who was helped in the Matter Hospital uh, in the early days of the Civil War was the former Minister for Defence, Cahill Brewer. He was suffering from the after effects of a major bullet wound to his leg, suffered in um, a fight with the Provisional Government's forces. The bitterness between former comrades um, that was part of the Civil War and inevitably, I suppose, was evident, I think, in this open letter, which was published by his wife, Kathleen. Mrs. Cahill Brewer requests that apart from family relations and intimate friends, the chief mourners and the Guard of Honour should only include the women of the Republic move, re movement. She makes this request as a protest against the immediate and terrible civil war made by the so-called provisional government of the Irish Republican forces. She does not desire the presence of any of the representatives of the Free State or its officials at the funeral and went on, note this does not exclude the general public from attending the funeral, who did indeed attend in very large numbers indeed. So although um, it's always said that there was a minority against the treaty, a lot of ordinary people would have been probably in two minds, but just more anxious to have peace. As I said, there are many references to Phibsborough in the witness statements of the Bureau of Military History and indeed in the military service pension applications files, which you can also search in the BMH website, uh, and to which I'm equally devoted. One such applicant was Elizabeth McGuire, who became Elizabeth O'Driscoll. Um, she lived in Phibsborough all her life and joined the Drumcondra brand, uh, branch of Cumann I think that because there doesn't seem to have been a Phibsborough branch, so I'm open to correction again on that one. I couldn't find a record of it. She was active, according to her application, between April 1920 and 30th of September 1923, although she claimed earlier service, but that was disallowed for pension purposes. In her application, she said she had handed out guns to men and took them back during the War of Independence. She kept guns and bomb, excuse me, but guns and bombs, jalignite fuses, cables and mine clocks in her home. During the Civil War, she was mobilized and reported to Healy's public house, where she prepared food for a few days and was later transferred to Findlater's. She carried arms for various attacks for the active service union. And in his reference letter, William Murray states that O'Driscoll was present during the following ambushes and attacks during the War of Independence. Attacks on Broadstone Outpost, Wellington Barracks, Collins Barracks, Four Courts Hotels and ambushes in Blessington Street, on Ormond Quay and on O'Connell Street. She carried guns for an attempt to rescue Mary himself from the Matter Hospital. And during the Civil War period, her home was used for the manufacture of munitions. Although she did say she'd have little part in that part of it. So I could ex 
spend all evening, as I said, talking about these, but they do shine a fascinating light on the period. And you can narrow your searches to specific areas like Phibsborough if you want to. And I think with the winter coming on, it's a fascinating way to spend your evenings. But during these years, life in Phibsborough was unlikely to have been just a series of car chases and covert activity. And there were no doubt many people who occupied themselves with less dangerous distractions. One such was the cinema, which was in its infancy in those years, but was well served in Phibsborough. Dennis Condon's blog on early Irish cinema offers a huge amount of information on what was on view 100 years ago. His excellent book, Early Irish Cinema, 1895 to 91, is a fascinating read as well. Although for some reason it doesn't seem to be available in library branches at the moment and you have to go into the reading room in Pier Street, which sadly is still closed, but hopefully will be reopening again soon. So the blog post that went up on the 23rd of May, 100 years after the opening of the Phibsborough Cinema, um, explained that the 23rd of May in 1914 was a Saturday. So some of the papers didn't cover the opening until their weekly theatrical column. However, they were all extremely complimentary about the new cinema, which was situated at Blackyear Bridge. He noted that the papers all seem to have been given the same publicity material by the cinema owners, so it probably would be expected that the praise was fulsome. He said that morning the Irish Times had carried the same article and a shorter notice in the Evening Herald was clearly working from the same publicity material provided to the Mail and Times. And he quoted, the promoters deserve every congratulation, not only as regards the excellent film presented, but also insofar as design, furnishing, lighting, ventilation, etc. are concerned, said the Herald. The house is most comfortable and great crowds have been enjoying both comfort and excellent fare provided. The architect, Mr. Aubrey O'Rourke, C not sure what that stands for, was paid, probably civil engineer, was paid a very high compliment by the directors at the opening ceremony. These days, Chris Phibsborough is credited with being one of the coolest places on the planet. And it was obviously considered to be an attractive place to live 100 years ago, even when tensions were high in the city and in the country. As an area, it had a considerable number of revolutionary activists in the streets, but light generally does attract like, and there were apparently enough comfortable pubs for conspirators to meet if they were not gathering in some of the then newly built houses. This has been a very brief outline, not quite as brief as I intended. Um, don't want to go over my time. Um, and if you could try and travel backwards, uh, I have no doubt that you'd still find many fascinating things uh, in Phibsborough. So it would have been the 19th, no, 20th century equivalent of the coolest place in town. So I do have no doubt also that my omission of sporting venues and other forms of entertainment will have been noted and you can comment. I won't pay any attention. I love cinema and history. Um, but I'd be delighted to hear of any information you'd like to share. So I'm going to finish here and hand back to Jonathan to chair any Q&A. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Mary, for a fascinating talk and um, really interesting talk. Um, so if anybody has any uh, questions, just, just type away in the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. So I'll have a look here and see what we have so far. Yeah, um, one from Julia, Mary. Julia says, the current resident of 34 Munster Street is watching with interest. Many thanks. Oh, thank you, Julia. That's great to know. Um, Tommy, Tommy asks, um, who did Boland, Harry Boland, who did Boland share cells with? Would you know that? 
Oh, um, no, I wouldn't. There were various at different times, and I don't want to start another civil war by speculating. I know there has been a lot of research into who it might have been, but because he was in jail frequently, um, yeah. It's nobody really, I think, wants to name somebody in particular. And anyway, sure. yeah. Thank, thanks, Mary. Tommy asks again, and where can I find eyewitness accounts on both the 1916 Rising and the Civil War around the Fibsborough area? If you go to, I, uh, Tommy, I hope you have, well, obviously you are online. So um, go to the Bureau of Military History website and um, it's there's a section on witness statements and you can search with keywords rather than names so if you don't have a particular name what you can do is i i searched for fibsborough and i got quite a few names that came up uh some because people were living in fibsborough when they gave a statement but in many cases because they'd been in the area during those events so that will give you quite a lot of information and i did the same thing with the pensions application files um it's, you know, it's a huge resource and unlike many other historical resources in other countries, in Ireland we can access it for free. So um, I, I think, you know, it is, we should make use of this amazing resource and uh, one thing I will warn you, now I know I'm a bit of a nerd when it comes to things like this, but uh, once you start, it's very, very hard to say, okay, I'll come back at another time. Uh, the reason I have to wear reading glasses is because it probably ruined my eyesight looking at screens for so long. But I can't recommend it highly enough. Thanks, Mary. A um, few comments. Um, Mary Maxwell said, thanks very much for the interesting talk. Fascinating talk. Um, a question here from James. James asks, the Blackwire Bridge, where did it get its name? Would you know that, Mary? Uh, do you know, I did read about it and now I can't remember. Um, yeah, it, I mean, as far as I can recall, it was something to do with uh, a person who was involved with the development of the canal. But uh, James, if you want to pass the query on to um, Jonathan, he can email me and remind me to look at it. I know I found it. But I just right now cannot remember. This is part of the huge mass of material that I've got in paper and <laughs> digitally. So that uh, was why I narrowed it down. Yeah, I also get old, can't remember things. That's great, Mary. And you can email me, um, James, at philsforlibrary at dublincity.ie. Um, Mary, fact. Fatna Rowe says, if De Valera spent so much time in Fibsborough, what happened to the seal of the Republic since he was later president? He's quoted in the book on the Irish harp emblem by O'Brogan as reference in it, but what happened to the seal? Uh, I presume he was keeping it somewhere safe or had somebody looking after it. Um, I don't actually know if it's not something I thought of. It's a good question, but, um, you know, since it survived, he wasn't carrying it around in his pocket or leaving it because the house would have been searched on a fairly regular basis. So it must have been somewhere a bit more uh, secure. Thanks, Mary. Um, Brian just said he's a new Fitzroy res resident on Berkeley Road and he really enjoyed the talk. Thanks very much. Ma Mary asks, um, where was the Fitzroy cinema located? Uh, on just beside Black Air Bridge. So where... I th there was a carpet store there at some stage. Be across the road from the library, <laughs> you know, that yeah. old cinema yeah. building, um, which now I think is divided into various fairly derelict looking businesses in some cases. But it's sad, but it was actually demolished. So what you've got there now is not the original building by any means. Yes. Unlike the uh, the other one, which I think was taken over by um, is it another carpet place, that you can see why cinema oh cinemas lend themselves to that sort of business. Yeah, uh, I'd always much rather see a cinema still there. Um, 
I, I, I wish that uh, Dennis Condon's book was more widely available because it really is a fact of all knowledge. But the blog, he has it very well, well laid out. And if you do put in your search terms, what information he has been sharing will come up. And he had quite a bit on um, the Bohemian cinema, especially. Thanks, Mary. Um... Aura asks, really interesting, thanks. You mentioned other talks, info on the library Facebook page. Are they still accessible? Um, I think oh, they gosh. are. I think, I think they, they should are. be. It's just, I, I'm not a Facebook fan, which is why I tend to be a bit slow about posting things. Um, I Actually, like things to be instant, and you do have to yeah. wade through if you don't quite know what you're looking for. But then my daughter constantly tells me that I'm, it's because I don't know how to use Facebook. Um, thanks, May. I think Kate from the Festival of History will answer that uh, right. for all of that. Um, Tommy has another question. He's, where exactly is Munster Street? It's off the main um, road out to uh, Drumcondra. So as you're going along, from, you've got the shopping centre on your left and then Connick Street. It's either the next one or the one after on your left, up off to that side. Thanks, Mary. Um, David Flood says there is a, a book published titled Our Rising, Cabaret and Fibsborough in the 1916 Rising. Um, Brian Hanley was one of the editors. Yeah, yeah that it's... was by the Cabra History Group. It's very useful. Uh, yes, I think we have that in the library, I'm sure. I'm we sure do. you do, yeah. yeah. Tony, Tony Black asks, uh, didn't the poet Austin Clark live in the area? Um, would it have been Mountjoy Street? And he says, great talk. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Um, no, actually, he lived in my neck of the woods, or at least he may have lived there as well, but there is a plaque to him on Manor Street in Stony Batter, which is really the coolest place on earth, but uh, we just <laughs> more modest about it. Thanks, thanks, Mary. Um, Paul, Paul answers, he says, Blackwire was a director of the Royal Canal Co. That's um, what I thought was something yeah. to do with the canal. Tim O'Neill says the same thing. Yeah, so. great, thank you. Sounds right. Um, David Flood says Hugo McGuinness, the other. Uh, David. And um, sorry, I'm having a senior moment here. Former uh, colleague of mine who now works with the Dublin Culture Company in Richmond Barracks. Oh, God, I can't believe I'm forgetting his name, Donald Fallon. Ah, yeah, okay. Yeah, so, okay. Uh, but it was with the Cabra History Group. I, I went to the launch for years ago. It was, it's great. I have the publication myself. Okay. Um, uh, David Floods, Hugo McGuinness, the other. Um, Owen Barrod says John the Black Choir was Chief Secretary for Ireland between 1772 and 1777. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I remember reading about that. But yes, yeah, I'm going to check up and I'll send you the information I find. Thanks, Mary. Um, Tommy has another question. Can we find anything on the voter register names, etc., for the area or any of the ordinary residents? You can. Uh, there's a database uh, on the uh, Dublin City Council histor History and Heritage section of their website. It is from that earlier period. So uh, there aren't as many voters, which is probably why I was able to do the database. There are various other sources, but that one kind of gives you immediate access to that period and who was living where, who had a vote. It's, it's quite depressing sometimes when you look through that and you see an area where there would have been a lot of people who were fairly active in their communities, not just politically, but in other ways, uh, who didn't have a vote or who clearly hadn't registered anyway. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Mary. Um, Frida Smith asks, were newly elected Sinn Féin TDs in 1917 and 1918 expected to reside in the constituency of their election? De Valera and East Clare? Question mark. Uh, 
Well, probably not, seeing as how Harry Boland was elected for Roscommon, yeah. and as you say, uh, no, I think they were more making the point that they stood in all of the constituencies where they thought they had a chance of winning, and it was an overwhelming whitewash of the Irish Parliamentary Party, at least as far as what's now the Republic was concerned. Thanks, Mary. Um, um, Owen says the fifth per cinema became the state. A um, couple more people. Um, thanks. Gorma, good, Mary. Um, as EB uh, says, we have a family story of a grand uncle being arrested mistakenly in Fibsborough as Eamon de Bader and taken to Dublin Castle. Where would we look for documents to confirm this story? Oh, gosh. Um, there are records, uh, again, I think they're available online of the Dublin Metropolitan Police the arrest and their various political reports that they made about meetings and things. So they might be the first port of call. Um, not something I've gone into very much myself, but I can look it up. Thanks for that, Mary. Um, uh, Tony Black says, there's always been debate on the name Cross Guns Bridge. Has Mary any thoughts on it? Yeah, I'm just trying to remember the stories that were told. Um, yeah, I mean, the, I think it was an enterprising pair of brothers in the 19th century who more or less set themselves up as... I don't know what you'd call them, um, but they were guarding the bridge and <laughs> charging a toll for crossing it, and the cross guns came from that. That's one of the stories. Uh, there are others, um, but, you know, it is fairly narrow uh, and would have been even more narrow when it was first built. But among the mass of material, again, I'll have to go through. I, I really need, do need. If somebody would like to volunteer at some stage, come do my filing. I'd be very grateful. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mary. Um, um, thanks for that. Um, interesting one here from Ethel Rowan. Rowan, not related to revolutionary Fillsborough, but do you know if it's true that Audrey Hepburn stayed in Fillsborough at some point? I'm a former resident of 32 Munster Street. Oh, right, thanks, Tor. Um No, I, I don't know. Uh, I was a big fan of hers, but um, yeah. <laughs> I, I never heard that. Um, no problem, Mary. Thanks. Um, Connor Walsh, uh, many thanks to Mary for a fascinating piece of local history. Thank you. Thanks. thanks. Uh, Fatna Rowe says, Gorham Agud. Um, I think... That's that's it, Mary. I don't think there's any more questions coming in. 